who have gone under the knife for surgery, or if you have visited someone in the hospital who has, then you know the sense of amazement at the technological skills of the surgeon and surgical team. Advancements in pre- and post-op care and the skill needed to repair or replace a body part or an internal organ, organ boggle the mind. But for me, the one that sticks out among all different surgeries that are amazing is heart surgery. Perhaps it's because the, we consider the heart so vital for our living. We consider it to be the energy pack for our life. We think of it as the power source for our life in this world. The reason that thoughts about the heart were circling around in my mind this week was because of the second lesson today that I read at the lectern from John's first letter in chapter 3. He uses the term heart four times, but he's not referring to a 9 to 12 ounce muscle the size of a fist inside our rib cage. He's using the term heart to refer to our spiritual energy pack, our spiritual energy source in our life with God here in this world and in the world to come. As amazing as it may be for us to consider the technical skills of a surgeon or the special skills needed for a surgical team or the equipment in an operating room, what really boggles the mind is the fact that the living Lord has performed heart surgery. He's performed heart surgery on us, giving us a heart that's not condemned, but a heart that's confident and caring. How about that? The living Lord has performed heart surgery on you and on me. Heart surgeries performed on soldiers wounded by bayonet or bullet began already in the late 1800s. What we know today as open heart surgery began more than 60 years ago. Truly amazing. But can you imagine a surgeon slicing into a chest, cracking open the sternum of a wounded soldier, and finding there a heart that's barely functioning, a heart that's actually rotting. If there were no Jesus, and no Good Friday, and no Easter, that's what God would find if he would slice into me, lying open on an operating table. Slice into me and open up, he would see and find a rotting heart. A heart oozing with the stink of selfishness and rotting with thoughts that what I want is better than what any other, other person wants or even what God wants. And just when I think I'm able to overcome that and compensate for my dead and dying heart, the symptoms pop up again and again and again, making me lie awake at night, thinking that what God really ought to do is cut into me not to repair or replace the damage, but to stick me with the hot, searing scalpel of his disgust at who I am and what I've done. And I don't have to scrape around in my memory banks too far to remind myself and prove to myself that's true. Because as recently as this morning, during the confession of sins, as recently as last Sunday, as recently as last month and last year, my heart condemned me. What am, I, what am I to do about that? What are you to do about the condemned heart inside of you? And what about our youth confirmands who in the next worship service will be standing up here and 
rightly proud to confess their faith in Jesus publicly, but also rightly sad that each week they'll be joining us after the opening hymn to stand and confess our sins. What are they to do? What are we to do? What we're to do is to, is to go to the words of our God through the Apostle John, who said this, If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts. What does that mean? That God is greater than our hearts, other than that the living Lord has performed heart surgery on us. Just as he promised. From the prophets long ago in scriptures, God spoke through the prophet, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And he did it. No surgery performed in the past or ever in the future will be able to match that because God's surgery adds the fabulous and the miraculous. As impossible as it is for a surgeon to open up a chest cavity and to see a dead or dying heart, to add the paddles clear and to expect it to come back to life, so impossible it is for anyone to bring back to life my dead and diseased heart. But God can do that. God can perform that surgery. And he did. If God can put my sins and yours onto Jesus, which he did, and if he can consider Jesus' death to be the payment for my sins and yours, which he did, and if he guarantees that he's not kidding around, but that he really has put new life into us by his spiritual surgery at Jesus' resurrection, and he did, so surely he can perform spiritual heart surgery on us so that we can stand before God not condemned with a new and living heart of faith. The living Lord has performed heart surgery on us, giving to us a heart that is not condemned. Two heart patients of similar age with similar symptoms, had similar surgeries on the same day. And they ended up across from each other in the ICU and later across the hall from each other on the recovery floor. One of them was convinced that he was going to be going home soon and within a few months he would be returning to normal activities. The other was convinced that his days were numbered. Which of them do you think went home sooner, and got better faster. I can't quote the statistics, but it just stands to reason that the one who believes in the skills of the surgeon and takes to heart the instructions and encouragement of the surgical team of nurses and physician's assistants and rehab specialists is going to go home sooner and get better faster. The living Lord has performed spiritual heart surgery and given to us a heart that is not condemned. But what about those days when we feel like giving Thomas a high five and saying, Thomas, I have doubts sometimes just like you. I've got eyes in the front of my head and ears on the side of my head and a brain behind them. And I can see and I can hear all the arguments that it makes no sense that God would care that much about us. That, that God would care about little piles of dirt like us, that he'd want us, piles of dirt, to live with him in perfect joy. Who's to say that there really is a heaven or a hell? Who's to say that we're not supposed to just live for today, party like crazy until the cows come home? And who's to say there's even going to be a tomorrow? That's when my heart lacks confidence. And that's when I need to go back and find a solid foundation. That's when I need real answers. That's when I need to hear from the lips of not my neighbor or my coworker or my professor, but from the lips of God himself, the facts. And that's when I need to crack open the only book that can withstand the scrutiny of all science and technology and prove to not only stand the test of time, 
but prove that it is the only book there is, a one-of-a-kind book from the lips of God to people and not the other way around. And when I do that, then I get confidence before God, the Apostle John says. In our next worship service, the youth confirmands will stand here confessing their faith publicly, demonstrating that they have confidence in the Bible stories they heard from mommy and daddy since they were one. Confidence in the message of the hymns and the liturgy they have been singing since they're three and a half or four years old. Confidence in the Bible passage they have memorized. Bible passage is plural. And the truths that they have learned from Martin Luther, Luther's little question and answer doctrine book. But then tomorrow will come for those youth confirmands. And they will face the inevitable challenges to their faith. People will get right up in their grill, right in their face, and we'll call them stupid, and we'll call them crazy, and we'll say to them, no one, no intelligent person would believe that a God made this entire universe in six natural 24-hour days. And no compassionate person would insist that marriage consists of just two people of the opposite gender. And no human would be able to remain abstinent from sexual activity until marriage. And when they face that, then those young confirmands will have the foundation of their faith shaken. Their faith will be like the fortresses in angry birds under attack from Zoom the yellow bird and from Bomb the black bird zooming in and soaring on high to explode the fortress of their faith. And then what are they supposed to do? Then they need to do what you and I need to do when our faith is under attack. And that's get on our knees and pray to the Heavenly Father for strength and courage in our faith. And God doesn't disappoint us. He promises to hear and answer every one of our prayers, especially the prayers to renew and strengthen our faith. The Apostle John said, Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from Him anything we ask, anything we pray for. And so how will the Lord God answer our prayers and the prayers of the youth confirmants to strengthen our faith? How will He answer those prayers? Here's what He will do. He will say, Keep your confirmation passage in your heart and say it every night before you fall asleep along with Martin Luther's evening prayer. And every morning when you get up, say Martin Luther's morning prayer and a passage from the Psalms that you have read. And then when you go off to college, connect yourself with a Lutheran chapel or church nearby to strengthen and nourish your faith. And for the rest of your life, don't even begin to think of missing out on worship and Bible study every week because that's how I, the Lord God, who have implanted in you a new heart of faith, that's how I am going to give you a heart of confidence. A heart patient who returns home from the hospital and turns himself into a couch potato, tossing his medications down the drain, slamming down bag after bag of greasy chips, washing them down with can after can of Milwaukee soda, is not going to do well at the next stress test. In order for a new or repaired heart to function well and with strength and power, it needs proper nutrition and exercise and depending on the person's age and general physical condition before surgery, you've seen that in heart patients that you know or maybe personally have experienced it. There's that guy with a zipper scar in the middle of his chest, jogging away on the treadmill, briskly walking down the sidewalk, zooming by during the half marathon. Proper diet, nutrition, and exercise strengthens the heart muscle in order for it to be active and to act and to do the Apostle John is writing a letter to Christians who are living in a world in which many people could care less about Christians or Christianity or Christ Jesus for that matter. And they would be tempted to hunker down 
and maybe hide their faith under a bushel basket. How would John be able to get them to live their life with power and courage for the Lord and to be active in their Christian life? Would he badger them into behaving for Jesus? Would he club them upside the head? Now get up and get out there for Jesus. Would he stand over them and threaten them with guilt? Would he say, you know, you better behave and do the Lord's will? No. The apostle did just the opposite. Tenderness and care spill out from every paragraph in this little letter. Listen, he says, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Dearly beloved, he calls them. This is his command, to believe in the name of Jesus Christ, his Son, and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit that he gives us. Which would you rather have and grow up with? Parents who ignore you when you fall off your bike and skin your knee or parents who wipe away your tears and pull out the band-aids? Which would you rather have? Parents who ignore you and turn a cold shoulder to you when they see that you are sulking after school because kids in class were making fun of you and you came in last in the forensics meet? Or parents who give you a hug and assure you that you are special to God and special to them? Which parents would you rather listen to and follow? Which God? Would you rather listen to and follow a God who forces you to bow down and kiss his sandals, who makes you wonder whether you have ever done enough to please him, or a God who laid his son's life on the line for you and says, I've implanted new life in you and given you a new heart of faith? Which God would you rather worship? A God who turns a cold shoulder to your prayers and ignores your concerns, or a God who has said, I have loved you with an eternal love and I have given to you new life and a heart to care not only for me but for people around you. You see, the living Lord has performed heart surgery on us, spiritual heart surgery, giving us a heart to care for him and for all around us, empowering us with his goodness and his love and his mercy so we can be active and energetic in our faith for him. I recall a youth confirmand from almost 30 years ago who sadly is not around here anymore. But on his day of examination and confirmation, he sat in one of the usher chairs I pulled from the back, right there in the middle between these pews, facing the Bible class and his relatives and our elders, and I said to him, go. And he proceeded to recite all six chief parts of Martin Luther's small catechism, that question and answer little doctrine booklet. Word for word, he recited it in 22 minutes without missing a comma. As the years have gone by, I've thought of him once in a while, and I've wondered whether the truths that were in his head have remained in his heart. The youth confirmands who will be standing up here in front in the next service are rightly proud to confess their faith in Jesus and during their examination that's going on with Pastor Bondo down below us right now in the Heritage Room, they may be able to recite passages and truths word for word or they, make, may, they might make a boo-boo or two, but that's not what's the most important thing. What's most important is what God did to their hearts and to ours. The living Lord has performed spiritual heart surgery on us. Treasure it. Use it. Amen. And please stand.